you catch something on it, you just, you just take a picture of it and send it to me. <laughs> Did you find, did they post that somewhere? Good. What I hear did not. Good deal. It's only going to be the south boat ramp available. See, that's the one that's been closed off because of the giant Savannah. shallow points out there in the main lake then. I don't know what the pool level is going to be in the five But uh, they, told, they told me they wasn't going to put it in the paper or anything. Yeah. I hope they don't. They were in the mouth to get around and it might still be an overwhelming event. Yeah. Everybody trying to get one boat around. So. I hadn't told anybody but you. I hope. Uh, I, hope, I hope we're the only ones that know. <laughs> they put some user shed in the lake. Good. I don't think they put enough in there. They may all got ate up already. Well, maybe they'll have a belly on them instead of being hollowed out like the last ones I caught there. and Westbury and talking to him about it, see see what it was like. Scooter act like he hadn't been out there in a good long time to know what it looked like. You want to talk about it with Kissler? Yes, sir. Did it open the back up? Not yet. Not yet. Seemed like they're getting ready for it, though. Still developing out there? I mean, they're talking about putting that resort in and all that. I don't know what they're doing. We just bought 33 acres right down the road from it to buy any of the other lots. Gotcha. Didn't get much action here lately. There's been a lot of action. Huh. Maybe it's just because it's that time of year.
Good evening. Don't forget, next Saturday to run your clocks up, time change. I'm telling you now because odds are I'm going to forget by Wednesday night to remind you again. It could happen, right? We'll have a time change. I'm kind of looking forward to it. I like having daylight tacked on to the end of the day, but that's, you know, that's, that's just me. This evening we are in Romans, the 10th chapter. We'll probably finish the 10th chapter this evening. Paul is not straying far from a thought that he began with at the beginning of chapter 9, his anguish over the state of spiritual Israel. They are away from God because they have not developed faith in Christ. And he has explained that in various ways uh, throughout chapter 9. I was hearing, I thought I was, I thought I was whistling. Okay. I was hearing something. Um, chapter 10, Paul begins honing in on a particular a particular fault that he finds in spiritual Israel. And we get here to the end of chapter 10, and he's going to begin honing in and focusing on a, another aspect of spiritual Israel and the reason for their apostasy. So as we look at the text, I think it's only good that we start with verse 13 because, well, we have to, to uh, track with what happens in the following verses. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, right? Now, this is, this is a, a powerful statement. We quoted a lot, even mentioned last week how many times it's taken out of context by a good number of folks, at least out of the context with which Paul is intending here in the text. However, as we jump into verse 14, how then when they call on him whom they've not believed, and how are they to believe in him? From whom they've never heard, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. They have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Now back in verse 14, Paul starts this new direction, right? All who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And how are they going to call on him in whom they have not believed? Now, this is just a, a logical assertion. No one had to do a whole lot of digging and scratching to see what Paul is getting here. You're not going to place your faith. You're not going to believe on someone that you don't believe in. You're not, you're gonna, you're not going to place the fate of your salvation in someone in whom you do not believe, right? Uh, we're not going to put our faith in Casper the Friendly Ghost to save our souls, right? Have to be, it has to be built on some sort of foundation, right? They don't believe the one whom they had sent. Now, the hymn here, we know who Paul is talking about. He's already hit on it earlier. Uh, the hymn in whom they have not believed is Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ. And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? Paul is developing an argument. He's going to address these phrases more in a few moments, but he's developing the, the, the argument here. Are they believe in whom they have never heard? And, and obviously, if you've never heard, you, you couldn't believe. Again, Paul's going to flesh this out a bit more in just a moment, as will we. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? This begins, you know, one of, one of our most uh, beautiful texts dealing with, well, gospel preachers. And what Paul does here is rather, rather genius because Paul is going to begin uh, likening uh, gospel preachers in the first century with the prophets of old. And we're going to, we're going to flesh that out and demonstrate it as we go here. Uh, but Paul is, is setting up a scenario, right? How are they going to call on someone they haven't believed? How are they going to believe in someone they've never heard of? And how are they going to hear of them unless somebody has been sent to tell them, right? All this is a scenario building up, and the answer is they can't. They don't. They have it, right? Paul is going to refute all that in just a moment. How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. We 
Let me back up just a moment because Paul digresses a bit, and I think we, we probably should too. I got to catch up. Here in verse 14, it begins a description of a rather, well, problem in a straightforward process of, of remedy. Um, you don't have faith in someone you don't believe. You don't have faith in someone you never heard of. You don't, you don't hear of him unless someone tells you about him. God sent the prophets in the history of Israel to bring news. We, the prophets are often called messengers as well, or the messengers of God. Now, not to be confused in the same language as what we're talking about, angels, but the prophets were chosen by God to bring oracles, oracles of doom, but also good news. Prophets such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, they would... They would bring revelations from God that would explain how terrible the state of Israel's spiritual condition was. Their idolatry had drawn them away from God. It has damaged their relationship. They're on the verge of destruction. Uh, they're in danger of deportation. They're right there on the verge of severing the covenant that God has made with them. And it's, it's all bad news, but always within the prophets, there's always the, the flip side, the good news, uh, the call to repentance. The good news in the Old Testament is that there's time for reconciliation. Put your idols away. Return to God. There's the opportunity to save the relationship, right? Preachers, in, in the same way, as Paul begins to flesh out for us, are messengers of God's word. They bring the gospel, the good news of Christ. And this is where Paul is focusing right now. This is on uh, the great message, the message of salvation through faith in Christ. He's been working on that now, right? From the very first chapter of Romans, that salvation uh, it comes through faith and faith in Christ uh, alone. And so he, he's, he's built to this moment here. He's got uh, the preacher in mind, this, this messenger from God who's delivering God's word, and he is the one that is the, the, the point of interaction, the one bringing the message, the good news, all right? Paul goes on here in verse 15, how are they to preach unless they are sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Uh, the first sentence here belongs with the question that was posed in verse 14 as well. How are they to preach unless they are sent? Now, Paul can be thinking of uh, the calling of the prophets, the prophets being sent by God, but he is most certainly uh, thinking of himself uh, as one sent, he can be uh, thinking of his own uh, calling, right? The road to Damascus, uh, Christ appearing to him on the way, and the nature of his ministry, right? He is a messenger sent by God as well with the good news. The problem is, is the messenger is often ignored. He's demonstrated by the prophets. In fact, Jesus uh, tells a parable. In Matthew, right? Matthew, I'm scrolling. Matthew 21, the parable of the wicked tenants. You know the parable. You have this uh, master who has planted a vineyard. He hires out tenants to come work the vineyard, and he goes to a faraway country. He sends a messenger on his behalf at the harvest time to collect that which is his portion to take back to him. The tenants, however, take the messenger and kill him. And the master of the vineyard sends more. The wicked tenants continue to kill the messengers. Uh, this is an especially heinous crime because 
in the honor and shame society, this relationship between uh, representative and master is one of such where the representative is afforded the same honor, the same authority as the one who has sent him. And so by symbolism, when they take and kill the messenger, they are dishonoring, disrespecting the, the master. So in the parable, the master sends his own son to collect that which is his, and they take the son and they kill him as well. Now the parable, we recognize that the messenger sent by God to collect what is due, or the messenger sent by the master who is God, is the prophets. Israel is the wicked tenants, killing the prophets that God has sent uh, to teach, to turn them back, to rebuke them. So God sends his son, right? He is the son that is sent to the wicked tenants. The wicked tenants take him and kill him as well. And Jesus is prophesying his own, his own fate, right? Paul is... Paul is hinting at this relationship. It's he's echoing, he's mirrored the relationship of prophets and preachers and the way Israel has received them historically in the prophets and now here in the first century how they have received preachers such as himself. Paul has undoubtedly already been persecuted by the Jews several times in his career by the time he writes this letter. Uh, you can go to uh, 2 Corinthians. You can read about all Paul has been through, all his shipwrecks, his stonings, his beatings, his imprisonments, right? He gives us a rundown of all that he's suffered at the hands of his own people. And so uh, Paul is making this very powerful connection here, this, this uh, relationship between uh, the one sent, uh, the preacher, and the message itself. And so we get to the second part here, verse 15. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. It's a language we don't use very much. Any of y'all think feet are pretty? Don't raise your hand. I don't want him to know. Don't raise your hand. Feet are not by nature all that pretty for most of us to look at. It's not the feet that are necessary pretty. It's poetry. It's Hebrew poetry. It is the willingness of the one being sent to go and ultimately the beauty of the message being sent. Have you ever ordered something from Amazon or something online? It's something you've been wanting. Maybe it's a new toy, a bass bait, or a sewing machine. I'm trying to think of stuff that you might be into. Anything that you're, you're just excited because whenever you get it, it's going to be something you either really need or looking forward to and... And then it gets to Olive Branch, Mississippi and gets hung up. That ha that's a real thing. It, it gets hung up in Olive Branch. There's something about Olive Branch that just sort of sucks in packages and holds it right there. And you might have to wait on it a week or two to get it once it gets there. And you're, you're, you're bummed out, really bummed out because it's hung up in shipping. Ooh, but then that day you're sitting there, the, the curtains are open, and you see that white truck pull up your driveway and you all of a sudden light up. It's not because that white truck's all that great, right? But you're thankful for the guy bringing it, and you're thankful for the thing that he brought. That's what Paul is getting at here. The message is being brought, and the person bringing it, they're doing something really wonderful, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing, right? Okay. But there's, there's a con to it. As bad as, or as great as it is to have the one sent, bringing this fantastic message of good news, they've not all obeyed the gospel. And Paul is going to really start tying, uh, tying Israel to its historical past right here. When he starts quoting Isaiah, such as right now, he is tying them back to their historical spiritual issues. They've not all obeyed the gospel, just like they didn't obey the warnings from the prophets. They did not heed the warnings of the, the, the prophets. Israel's carried off into Assyrian captivity. Judah's carried off into Babylonian captivity. It's not good, right? They didn't heed the warnings. They didn't listen to the message. Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? 
That's Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. The problem is, is no one, no one believed, right? This is at 53, verse 1. I forgot I put it on a slide. Who has believed what he's heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So we get to verse 17, comes this another verse. It's another one of those staples that we remember. We pull it up at, at will. It's one of those we memorize, learn, and, and keep it close to our hearts. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Verse 17 sets up two things. First of all, it demonstrates our dependence on God's word for establishing faith. That's where faith begins. That's, that's where it's grown and that's where it's cultified. It, it, do, it doesn't happen apart from God's word. I would tie in another uh, symbolic meaning too from the gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Jesus Christ as the word of God. In the Old Testament, if, and, and Paul is quoting from the Old Testament, the word of God is the embodied wisdom of God. So we take this study of what the word is in the Bible and the word becomes the wisdom of God and then that word becomes manifested in the flesh. Then Christ becomes the wisdom of God. It's a pretty amazing, pretty amazing study to embark on. Faith comes by hearing, hearing through the word of, of Christ. The second thing that this does, it sets up the reason for Israel's spiritual state, where they are right now in the first century as Paul's writing. This is how Paul is going to explain where Israel is. All right. So verse 18, we'll read through 21. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their voice are the words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? For Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. And then 20, then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Okay, back to verse 18. We have the interlocu interlocutor. I feel like I'm tripping over my tongue there. Paul's imaginary opponent in this debate, this diatribe. He is anticipating his questions. Israel's got problems. They didn't receive the prophets, so they didn't receive the preachers. Therefore, they haven't believed in the one whom was sent. They didn't believe the good news that they were told. It's a problem, right? But verse 18, his opponent in the diatribe, his interlocutor, yeah, pretty sure that's right, I ask, have they not heard? That's his question. We have a reason that we didn't obey this good news. We didn't hear it. That's the argument. We didn't hear that good news. Paul's response is, indeed, they have. Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. He's quoting again, and I thought I had that. That's from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 21, and I think I do have that somewhere. Right there, Deuteronomy 32, verse 21. They have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols, so I will make them jealous with those who are no people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Verse 19, but I ask, did Israel not understand? This is the second question of Paul's verbal opponent here. First one, first question, verse 18. Have they not heard? They didn't hear it. We didn't hear it. Verse 19, the question is, they didn't understand. Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. This is pretty pointed and pretty, pretty blunt. Um, 
even the Gentiles who were not God's chosen people, who did not have the prophets, who did not have the law, even they heard the gospel and understood it. Even they understood it. And that gets us back to Deuteronomy 32, 21, which both of these passages are quoted from. from. They made me jealous with what is no God. Idols, right? They're idolatry. They provoke me to anger with their idols. So I'll make them jealous with those who are no people. They weren't chosen, the Gentiles. And in the case of the letter to the Romans, Greeks, I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. This foolish nation, the nation of Gentiles as a people, were unaware, unaware of God, unaware of his uh, covenant, unaware of the law, yet chosen to be included. We trace that back to the Abrahamic covenant. Paul has already hit on that throughout the book of Romans, right? Then Isaiah is so bold as to say in verse 20, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I've shown myself to those who did not ask for me. Isaiah 65, 1, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that was not called by my name. So Paul has set up the scenario to his imaginary opponent explaining the spiritual condition of Israel. Uh, they can claim that they didn't hear the gospel, but they did. They can claim that they didn't understand it. Well, the most ignorant among you did, so therefore you should have. You are without excuse. And then he cites passages from the prophets. Doing this, one, it cites the historical premise for what he's saying. But two, it, just, it, it, it shows the tendency, the hard-headed nature of God's people to refuse his word. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. Very pointedly speaking to those outside of Israel, outside of God's chosen or covenant people. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that was not called by my name. That's extremely, as extremely strong language by God. He's ready to go to another people. I'm going to send you into captivity, and we're going to we're going to pick this up with another people. We're going to we're going to let's just now, verse twenty one. But of Israel, he says, all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Now, I believe I can probably nutshell this a lot easier than what I actually taught the lesson. So let's do this. I, I said from the very beginning, keeping the context in line with Paul's argument because he has been arguing from point to point throughout the book of Romans. He's been making a statement, then allowing his imaginary opponent to ask questions and then answering those questions. And sometimes answering those questions would provoke more questions. And that's what Paul is still doing. He hasn't stopped at still going on. Notice the first question in verse 18. Was it because they didn't hear the gospel? Paul's answer was no. It's not because you didn't hear the gospel. The second question was, was it because they didn't understand the gospel? Paul said, well, even the most ignorant, the ones that were not God's people, the ones who didn't have the law, the ones who didn't have the prophets, they understood it. So really, what he's saying is you're without excuse if you say you don't understand it. And so verse 3, or the third point is, is there was a reason. There was a reason that they didn't obey the gospel. There was a reason they didn't receive it. It was because of their disobedient hearts. Look again at verse 21. But if Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. We use language like hard-headed, hard-hearted, disobedient and contrary is pretty good. I mean, that's, that, that gets right to the heart of it. When a, when a people such as Israel have God's 
law revealed to them, prophets sent to them, messengers from God to help teach them and keep them on track and get them back on track and historically for them to refuse them is pretty egregious. But Paul makes the connection for us here in this last part of chapter 10 that that's exactly how Israel has treated God's preachers, his messengers of the good news. They refused Christ. They refused his apostles. They refused the preachers. He calls himself a preacher quite often in the text. They're doing the same thing that they always have. So here Paul is, one, explaining why he's in anguish over his fellow Israelites. By and large, it's been because of their disobedient and contrary hearts. Right? Paul has turned his ministry towards the Gentiles as a result. He suffered persecution at the hands of the Jews. All the while... Paul is reconciling this overarching point in the the letter to the Romans that salvation is for everyone, Jew and Gentile, but that salvation is only available through faith in Jesus Christ. And that gospel is the thing that Israel, by and large, rejected. They continued rejecting the word of God. So there is the fault. Now, he's not done yet. That's just the end of chapter 10. But uh, we see the spiritual state of Israel through Paul's eyes. We have a a disobedient, contrary, hard-headed, hard-hearted people who refuse to receive the message sent by God. The good news, that leads us to the preachy part of the lesson, right? It's scary because... They did have the law of Moses. They had the prophets. They had it in writing in the first century. The Pharisees, one of the most well-studied of the sects of Judaism, got it wrong. He's already, Paul's already fleshed out why they got it wrong. They missed the weightier matters of the law. They They were trying to earn their salvation through the strictest of obedience rather than pursuing the law through love and grace and mercy, which are the essence of the law. They messed up. They refused the good news. Christ, as what Paul taught just a few verses earlier ahead of verse 13, that Christ was the fulfillment of the law. He is the end of the law for those who believe. The scary part is, is we've been given the testimony of Christ. We have the Gospels. We have Paul's letters. We have wisdom literature in the New Testament. We have so much to guide our thoughts, to guide our lives, to teach us, to instruct us how how we live, how we develop our relationship to God, but we can be very guilty of the exact same thing that Israel was, We can set it aside and not look at it, not pay attention to it and just do our own thing. That's that's what uh, human, we're getting into philosophy here now. That is what humankind tends to do. We tend to choose self over God. That's the reason the fruit looked good. It was pretty. It looked like it would bake up nice in a pie and it'd make one wise like God. We tend to choose self over God. That means we choose the things we want over the things God wants, and after a while of doing that, it doesn't take much, we quit even trying to pursue the things God wants. And we just live our life and assume that God is going to be happy with what I'm doing because God is loving, he's forgiving, he's gracious, he's merciful, indeed he is, but there's no place in Scripture that you're going to find where God has taken a fool. It's not there. God's people are a faithful people, and being a faithful people means being faithful to his word. Obedience is still important. It is a derivative of faith. It's a derivative of of love. It's our reaction to the gospel. It's what Israel missed. They, they They built this religion of their own based on the laws God gave Moses, but it in no shape or form reflected God's intentions. 
We can be guilty of the same as Christians. We can turn faith in Christ into something it was never intended to be, a get-out-of-jail-free card or something sinister like that. We can use the gospel of Christ to excuse any type of lifestyle we want to live. We see it today very plainly and clearly. But that is not the intention of the gospel. The good news is good news. It is great news. It is freedom from sin. It is opportunity for life everlasting, but it's reserved for the faithful. Learning what the faithful is is what you and I do for the rest of our lives. We pursue that through his word, through prayer. We try to be the faithful people that God desires us to be because we desire all that God offers is faithful. Okay, that is Romans chapter 10. We'll pick up in chapter 11, week after next, uh, as Travis. Travis is going to speak for us next Sunday night while we're out of town. Uh, so I uh, look forward to that. Come and support him. The following Sunday night, we will start Romans chapter 11. Tonight, however, uh, we do want to extend the invitation. You need the prayers of the church. Baptized into Christ. We would love to help you this evening as we stand and we sing our song. <laughs>